everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar. My name is Lisa Page, and I'm the Community Relations Associate at Belmont Village Lakeway. Belmont Village Senior Living is the leading provider of assisted living and an award-winning memory care program. If you would like more information about our senior living solutions that Belmont Village Westlake Hills or our Belmont Village Lakeway communities can provide, please do not hesitate to reach out to either Jamie Smithson and or I. Just a little housekeeping before we get started, if you have any questions during the presentation, please type them into the Q&A box in your control panel instead of the form or chat feature. Any questions submitted during the presentation will be answered at the end. Um, and then during the presentation, um, Dr. Chala will open it up and I will be able to enable everybody to be able to talk. So you can either use the Q&A feature or you can um, click your microphone and ask your questions. Um, so today our webinar on Ask a Cardiologist, Heart Healthy Living will be presented by Dr. Chala. Dr. Chala specializes in all areas of general cardiology, but with interest in preventative cardiology, lipidology, and cardiac imaging. Now, without further ado, I'll turn it over to Dr. Chala. Hi, can you guys hear me? Yeah. You can, good. I just want to make sure I wasn't on mute, okay. Well, welcome. Thanks for, thanks for inviting me. Thanks for joining. Um, hope everyone is doing well today. So um, thanks for the introduction. My name is Dave Chowler. I am a cardiologist at Baylor Scott & White. I work out of three different locations, Georgetown, Sun City location, the Westlake location, and the Austin downtown locations. Um, <clears throat> so I'm just going to give a, a, a quick, so the way I was going to do this, just give a quick run through on basic um, Base, very basic cardiac anatomy physiology, um, just to give a little bit of background. This is actually, so these slides are actually the same slides that I gave to my kids um, fourth grade um, class <laughs> last year. So, um, I, so, you know, hopefully it'll be okay. They actually helped me, helped me put this together at that time. So there we go. So as I mentioned, I am a cardiologist, so I am the guy that brings the cards. My, all, the, all the jokes in here were put in there by my kids. I didn't have a whole lot of control over that, I'm afraid. So I, I apologize if, um, if they fall a little flat. So first of all, I was just gonna um, run through the cardiac physiology a little bit. So, you know, the heart is in the center of our chest. It's about the size of your fist. Um, you know, it has four chambers, it has the left ventricle, the right ventricle, the left atrium and the right atrium. The ventricles are at the bottom part of the heart. The atriums are the top part of the heart. So the atriums receive blood. So back in Roman times, the atrium was the receiving chamber to the house, the Roman houses. So in the same way, the atrium is the receiving chamber in the heart. Um, the, le the ventricles pump blood. So they receive blood from the, the ventricle, flows from the atrium to the ventricle, and then the ventricles pump blood. The ventricles are considered the main part of the heart. And in Latin, actually ventricle means belly. So it is the ventricles are the belly of the heart, which is supposed to kind of mean that it's the main part of the heart. <clears throat> so the left ventricle pumps blood to the body. So to all our organs, to the arms, the legs, the brain, the kidneys, the liver, our extremities, um, and perfuses, perfuses our body parts and our organs with oxygen and nutrients. Um, once, the, once our body parts and our, you know, our soft tissue and our organs consume the oxygen and the nutrients, blood then flows back to the heart, to the right side of the heart via the veins. Um, blood then receives is received by the right atrium, flows into the right atrium and starts filling up the heart again. Once the pressure in the right atrium exceeds the right ventricle, the tricuspid valve opens. That's the valve that separates the right atrium and the right ventricle. Um, and the right ventricle starts to fill. Once the pressure in the right ventricle exceeds the pressure in the pulmonary artery that goes to, to the lungs, the pulmonic valve opens and blood flows through the pulmonary artery to the lungs where it receives um, oxygen um, and becomes replenished. Once it's replenished, it flows um, 
through the pulmonary veins into the left atrium, gets, goes back to the left side of the heart. Eventually that will flow through into the left ventricle. And um, again, and then eventually it'll go through the aorta uh, and start feeding the rest of the body again. The valve that separates the left atrium from the left ventricle is the mitral valve and the valve that separates the left ventricle from the aorta and thus um, the rest of the body is the aortic valve. There are three components to, let me just move this out of the way, there we go. Uh, three components to um, cardiac care. So one is plumbing, interventional cardiology, where we take care of the blood vessels in the heart, make sure they're open. Um, and it's really the plumbing or the blood vessels of the heart that become, become diseased in um, heart attacks, um, unstable angina, that kind of thing. There's the electrical part of the heart. Um, where we have cardiac electrophysiologists who can take care of heart arrhythmias, heart block, um, and that sort of thing. And then obviously there's pump failure where the muscle itself is not working. Um, and these can be secondary, they can be secondary to plumbing disorders, so blockages in the blood vessels. Um, pump failure or failure of the ventricle to contract, pump failure can also be due to alcohol, to viruses, the coronavirus can actually cause this, that's kind of topical these days, uh, unfortunately. Um, drugs can also cause it cocaine and diabetes. Sugar itself can cause it high sugar. So this is a, this is a typical characterization of a cardiac interventionalist, um, one of the plumbers of the heart and the cardiac electrophysiologist who um, tend to see themselves as the more cerebral, um, more intelligent cardiologists, I guess. <clears throat> So we mentioned plumbing, plumbing problems, clogged pipes. Um, this is due to hardening of the arteries, due to fat take up by the lining of the blood vessels in the arteries in the heart. Um, so usually what happens is in situations like this, there's some kind of damage to um, the lining of the blood vessels in the heart, the coronary arteries, and this predisposes um, fat to accumulate um, cholesterol to accumulate in those um, blood vessels. Um, hypertension can contribute to this. Smoking can, talk, can contribute to this. Tobacco use as well as diabetes. And that's because nicotine in tobacco is toxic to the endothelium. That's the cells that line, line the blood vessels of the heart. High blood sugar is also toxic as well as um, high blood pressure um, can also damage a little bit because of the high shearing forces from high pressure of that blood flow in the coronary arteries, um, that can also damage the cells, the endothelial cells in the lining of the blood vessels in the heart. Um, and then one, once that plaque builds up um, from high cholesterol in the blood vessels in the heart, under, under situations where it can become inflamed, such as emotional stress, the common cold, can, you know, there's lots of things that can cause inflammation of that plaque, it can then rupture, and um, when that happens, the fat in that plaque, in the blood vessel lining, leaks into the blood vessel and the sticky cells, the platelets in the blood, they jump on it because it shouldn't be there. They see it, they jump on it and they can form a blood clot. And um, that's, that's essentially a heart attack or an MI, <clears throat> myocardial infarction. Typical symptoms of angina, um, myocardial infarction, Neck, jaw discomfort, chest pain, obviously chest discomfort. It's usually chest pressure and it's right in the center of your chest. <clears throat> Arm or back discomfort, trouble breathing, fatigue, lightheadedness, or just abdominal pain or feeling sick or nauseated. Men tend to have more chest discomfort. Women actually tend to have more trouble breathing, um, statistically speaking. These are the kind of the cascade of tests that we use to diagnose plumbing problems. You know, the very basic um, old school test is the electrocardiogram, where by changes in the baseline, we can actually diagnose heart attacks very easily, uh, major heart attacks anyway. Um, this is a stress test where we can actually look at blood flow all through the heart muscle here, and we can look at disparities. And this is actually a coronary CT where we can actually do a CAT scan of the blood vessels and we can actually look at plaque in the blood vessels themselves. This here 
that we're looking at where the arrow is pointing to is um, the left anterior descending coronary artery. And the very white substance here is calcified plaque. As that plaque over time, you know, it starts off as fatty plaque. Over time, that becomes scarred over with scar tissue and eventually calcified. And this is a coronary angiogram, a cardiac cather catheterization, where um, we actually squirt dye into the blood vessels. And we look at these blood vessels with x-rays, so it's, it's fairly non-invasive. Um, and then if there is a blockage, which there is here, where you can see here in the left main coronary artery, this is actually the widow maker. Um, they can then put a wire down here, open up that blockage with a balloon, and um, then put in a stent, which is inflatable over the balloon, and that stays in place to keep this blood vessel open. And the stent is just a little wire mesh. And this is what a stent looks like, the little wire mesh here. Um, <clears throat> and these days we do, they, they do tend to be coated with a medication that helps prevent plaque accumulation on the inside of that stent. If the blockages are too diffuse, they're too severe, too diffuse, and in multiple vessels, then you know, we, we do have other options such as bypass surgery. There's also lots of good medications um, that we use to treat heart disease. And not everyone with a blockage actually needs a stent. We do have a lot of medications that if the blockage is, if the symptoms are mild, the blockage is in a location that is not very high risk, um, patients may actually do better with medications and just leave the blockage as it is. And lifestyle changes are obviously key, Smoke, smoking cessation, exercise, diet, and stress, stress reduction. And there's, there's lots of information on diet um, that we can talk about later too. So this is what it looks like on the inside of the blood vessel um, when you do have coronary atherosclerosis or hardening of the arteries. And then you can see the fat here and the narrowing of the blood vessel that blood flows, flows through. And you can see this is actually a blood clot because this fat in this plaque, this plaque ruptured, the, the fat leaked out, the cholesterol leaked out, and these platelets jumped onto, um, jumped, on, jumped onto the fat in the bloodstream and caused a blood clot and caused a complete occlusion of this blood vessel. So th this, is, this is what a um, ECG looks like when someone is having a heart attack. Um, and this is called, this is what we call ST elevation, and it's actually called tombstone um, of the ST segment on this ECG that is indicative of an ST elevation myocardial infarction, which is the worst type of um, heart attack. <clears throat> so the, these are kind of the steps that we go through when a patient does go to the emergency room for a heart attack. The very first thing they'll get is an electrocardiogram, um, the ECG. They'll, they'll then get medications, and if they need to, um, they'll go to the cath lab for um, a stent. Um, and the initial medications are typically morphine, oxygen, nitroglycerin, um, aspirin. Aspirin is actually the very first thing that people get, and um, typically beta blockers as well. So, you know, if, if you're at home and you, you feel like something like this is happening, the first thing you should actually do is get take an aspirin and chew it. And if you chew it, it gets absorbed into the blood very quickly just a full aspirin to that, um, and that can actually be life-saving in itself before um, care arrives to, you know, better care arrives to take care of you. And then this is, this is a little bit more detail going through the electrical system of the heart. There's also heart arrhythmias, where you can have heart block, you can have slow heartbeats, where the top part of the heart and the bottom of part of the heart don't communicate well with each other. They can, that can slow down the bottom part of the heart. It can also put the, put the heart out of sync a little bit. It can make the heart uncoordinated. Um, you can also have tachyarrhythmias where the heart, heart can go fast. This can either be from the top part of the heart, such as supraventricular tachycardia or atrial fibrillation, which is actually very common. Or um, it can be from the bottom of the part of the heart, ventricular tachycardia, ventricular fibrillation, which are much more dangerous and associated with cardiac arrest. And these are the kind of arrhythmias that we worry about in the setting of the myocardial infarction as well. So typical symptoms of <clears throat> cardiac arrhythmias include 
you can get chest pain and shortness of breath, but it's typically more lightheadedness, passing out, fatigue. Um, and obviously, if it's, the, if it's a fast uh, tachyarrhythmia, a fast heartbeat, then you, would, you could also feel your, your heart race. And that's kind of it, just to go through a few basics. Um, So I'll open it up, open it up as well. Um, you know, we can talk about, if you have any questions about diet, preventative cardiology at all. I'd love to. I'd love to take questions. Yeah, Dr. Okay, I'm allowing everybody the ability to talk right now. So if you all have questions and want to ask them live, you just have to press your unmute button and you can ask them. Um, otherwise, you still have the feature where you can um, text or type it into the Q&A box. There we go. Gwendolyn, do you have a question? John, do you have a question? No, no, I'm not okay. with you. Let's see. I do, have, I do have a question. Can you hear me? Yes, absolutely. Who's this? Sorry. Okay, I am um, overweight, and uh, but okay. I really have uh, adjusted to a healthy, what I think is a healthier diet. Does okay. that? Necessarily mean that I am uh, susceptible to blockage in the arteries. Um, I was on metformin and they took me off that because they said okay. my enzymes were were going higher. So I. Oh goodness. Okay. Sorry about that. Okay. Well, I mean, but nobody's given me an explanation. And um, actually, it's been six, at least six months off of um, the metformin and pravastatin. And uh -huh. so the liver enzymes are a little lower, but not significantly to me and yeah. put me on Ozempic, but because of the cost of Ozempic, um, <coughs> I'm not going to be able to maintain that. So okay. yeah, um, it's I'm waiting for the doctor to tell me if I can go back on Prevostatin and Metformin. Okay. So you are diabetic. Is that correct? Yeah, but it's controlled and I'm like 6.1. I've never oh, yeah, been, very controlled. Okay. Yeah, never and, been higher than six uh, point something. And you're not on insulin, correct? No. No. Okay. Okay. So, you know, um, yes, di both diabetes, high blood pressure, you know, um, high cholesterol do, do predispose. They do increase the risk of, of heart disease. Um, do you have any symptoms? You don't have any symptoms, chest pain, shortness of breath, arm pain, jaw pain, no, anything? No, no, I don't. Um, you feel my, good. My blood pressure, it runs around 129 <coughs> or uh, 65. Um, oh, although good. my family, everybody has had heart problems. Okay, okay. So, you know, first of all, um, you know, so heart disease is the sort of thing that anyone will get if you live long enough. It's just kind of one of those things that accumulates. You know, everyone will get diabetes if they live long enough. The beta cells in your pancreas will just wear out. Um, you know, the, the only diet that's actually been shown. So first of all, you know, heart disease is more prevalent now than it's ever been. And one of the reasons in my mind is just the diets that everyone has been on. And especially, you know, in the, in the Western, in the civilized world, um, you know, there's things like high fructose corn syrup is everywhere. It's in ketchup, it's in cereal, it's in... Yeah, and see, I grew up without salt because that was my father's, you know, he, he couldn't have it because of his health. Okay. Um, and like I said, I... I don't know. I don't know. I'm, I'm doing water aerobics now. I'm Good. adjusted my diet quite a bit, but uh, and on the Azembic, they said I should see that I lose weight, but instead I gained 10 pounds. Does that make gotcha. sense? So yeah. I, I'm I fr see. frustrated. So, you know, so the only diet, I'll go a couple of things. So the only diet that's been shown to lower cardiovascular risk is the Mediterranean diet. Yeah. Um, and when they looked at the Mediterranean diet, they did look at, in the Mediterranean diet, what is driving those improved outcomes? And it was really three food groups. It was nuts and seeds, extra virgin olive oil, 
and whole grains. So nuts and seeds, extra virgin olive oil, and whole grains. Um, there's also, you know, I'm also a big proponent of not eating too many meals and trying to dis, trying to space well, out. They had, they had, I've been fasting for about three months where I stop eating at 7 p.m. and I don't okay. eat until noon the next day. And okay. that, in that time frame is when I've put on this extra 10 pounds. So really, I'm, that's kind of weird. Okay. Yeah, I know. That's and kind of uh, because I'm used to eating, you know, I used to normally eat a nice breakfast in the morning and then uh -huh. dinner around five o'clock. And yeah, so that is strange because you know when you're doing that intermittent fasting, and I'm a, I'm a big believer in that. You know, uh, you're you're not using your fuel stores. You're not using your immediate exactly um, fuel, and you're breaking down fat more to use as fuel. You're breaking down triglycerides, fat cells into into fatty acids. Um, you know, one thing that would be worth looking at actually, because you said your liver enzymes were up, would be to take a look at your liver with an ultrasound or something, because it sounds you know someone like you with diabetes and high cholesterol. Um, you could easily have a fatty liver. And if that's the case, and that's not a good reason to cut down on the metformin or the tarpostatin, in fact, it would actually may be beneficial to increase both of those if um, it's a fatty liver that's causing it. Um, and fatty liver is probably the most common cause of elevated liver enzymes these days, you know. And all it is is fat accumulation in the liver, and it's probably the most common cause of cirrhosis now. It never used to be, but we've got to that point where fatty liver has become, you know, um, and there is an increased risk of heart disease in people who have fatty liver so too. Did, did I understand you to say um, if uh, they come back after an ultrasound and say it's definitely fatty liver that it is okay to increase the pravastatin? And in well, it kind of it depends on the pattern of your lab. So if your labs are actually going up quite a bit, then there's other there's other options to lower your cholesterol. So the two the two best medications in the setting of any kind of liver disease if if, if your liver disease is active, meaning it's getting worse. So you don't want to increase the statin if it's actively getting worse, but if your liver enzymes are stable and they're not getting worse, then yes, it's actually okay to increase the thermostatin if it's because of a fatty liver. Now, if it's active liver disease and your enzymes are going up, then the two medications that are the safest to use are Vascepa, which is just fish oil, it's EPA, and that does lower, that does lower, lower cholesterol as well as lowering cardiovascular risk, and um, either Repatha or Pralluin, which are injectables. And those are injections every two weeks. They're actually less side effects than any of the other medications. Um, uh, what are the injectables like the Ozempic? You mean, or you mean? No, no. So this is for cholesterol. So it's not so. Yeah, it's oh, cholesterol inject. Oh, yes, yeah, yeah. so the the PSCK nine A inhibitors. And what, what the injection is is it's it's an antibody, and the antibody works against the PSCK nine A protein. And that came about it came about several years ago, where they found so. Well, what the PSCK9A protein does is it binds to the LDL and the LDL receptors, so you flush them both out. So it stops your, it actually, that protein stops you getting rid of LDL, basically. It stops your own body from flushing out LDL. So they did find that it's a, it's a, a, a genetic population, it's, a, it's actually a subgroup of African Americans who have a mutation in that protein, it doesn't work. And those guys they found that never ever get heart disease. So they made an antibody against it. So it stops our own one from working. And it actually lowers your cholesterol more than any other medication, including statins. It also lowers cardiovascular risk more than any other medication, including statins, actually. Um, but they're very expensive. They're only approved. Oh, wow. Well, here we go. A lot of work to get it approved. It's kind of like the Ozempic that you take. But in the setting of active liver disease, if the liver enzymes are going up, that's one reason to try that, that may get it paid for, you know. It may, and it's really, you know, your doctor would know better. Well, can I, can, can I give you the numbers? I mean, the, I've got my yeah, results right here. I had the uh, hepatic uh, function panel. And yeah. um, I mean, back in uh, 2018, I was at 80, I was 47 um, on the uh, ALT. ALT, okay. And it jumped to 80 um, <laughs> the next year. And okay. uh 19 and then it jumped to 129 yeah by the end of the year and now it's uh back down to 91 but uh that's being off of the pravastatin and off of metformin because the way the doctor explained it it accumulate could accumulate in my liver 
Yeah, the metformin, not as much. It's more, you know, you should, it would be worth, ch so when did you start those medications in relation to those labs? What, the metformin and provostatin? Yeah. Well, I've always been on those. Um, oh, you have? Yeah, but they took me off of those uh, about six, eight months ago. Okay, so it's worth getting your liver checked out, see what's causing it. Okay, okay. I causing. appreciate that. And, and if I'm it's a fatty liver, then, then it's not because of those medications. Okay. All right. Well, I appreciate that. I'm sorry. I've never done a Zoom before and I just realized you can see me and I just- I see. I, 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 I actually can't see you. you oh, good. Good. Go because on. I just came from the pool. And <laughs> oh, that's funny. <laughs> and I'm like, oh my God, if I had known. All right. I'm sorry. I don't want to take up anybody else's time. If they oh, no, me. you're good. So, um, yeah, I, I was glad because- I think with COVID, the problem is, you know, they make these appointments, but then they don't ever follow up. And uh, uh, I got you. it's like, okay, you ran all these tests is that you've got the test panel. Why doesn't somebody get back to me and let me know what I should be doing, you know, next. So, um, no, I understand. I'm, frust I'm frustrated at this point. So, oh, I'm sorry to hear that, my dear, but that's all right. Um, I'm glad to be able to, uh, take advantage of this, uh, program today. So thank you very much. No, not at all. God bless. Have a good holiday. Thank you. You too. Stay safe. Yeah. And you and you. Thank you, Gwendolyn. Um, I see that John has his hand raised. Uh, John, go ahead and unmute yourself and you can ask a question. Uh, yes. Uh, can you hear me? Okay. okay. Yeah. I, can, I can't see you though. Okay. I don't know if you wanted me to hey, see thank you. Thank you. Um, <laughs> uh, my um, cholesterol was in uh, well within recommended or, or acceptable <coughs> levels. Yeah. However, I asked the doctor if I could prevent uh, buildup in the future. So I am taking a statin, a low dose statin. Do you yeah. think that's wise? Or am I uh, hurting myself or do you think that's... Uh, By taking a statin? Back? I'm sorry? By taking a statin, you mean? Is that your question? Do you think, do you think it's wise that you're taking a statin? Yes, that's my question. Yeah. yeah, okay, okay. So it kind of depends on a lot of, how old are you, John, if you don't mind me asking? How old am I? Yeah. Uh, 85. <laughs> 85, okay. Yes. yes, a young 85. A young 85, you sound, <laughs> you sound like a young 85. Um, so, you know, so as, and you don't have any, you don't have any heart history, no, no um, stents, nothing like that in your heart. No. Well, when I first started taking that, that little bit of mess lake, but that went away. No, no, but you don't have any heart problems. You don't, you don't have any history of any heart attacks or stents in your heart. No, no, no. no. And you're not diabetic. No, I, I do. My, my biggest problem, as you can tell, is I have a little bit of hearing uh, disability. Oh, I got you. So I might ask you to repair your question. So you're not diabetic, correct? I don't. Uh, I didn't understand that, sir. Sorry. Are you, are you diabetic? diabetic you are oh not. no no i'm not diabetic no. thank you my no. wife so you know if you feel well and you don't have any heart disease at all um if it's not if you uh, if it's if you're having side effects with statins then um you know it's it's hard to say how much benefit you're going to get at the age of 85 you know because the benefit is accumulative in, in patients who are asymptomatic mm -hmm. um no disease no diabetes um the it's accumulated over time, you know. So if you were 35 and you, you know, you you had risk factors for heart disease, I could tell you, yes, you, you know, take a statin and it will lower your risk of heart disease um, by about 40 to 50 percent over the course of your lifetime. Mm -hmm. Now, as an 85 year old who's asymptomatic with no diabetes seems to be pretty healthy. It would depend on how high your cholesterol is. I, I would accept a slightly elevated cholesterol. Um, I would focus more on the Mediterranean diet, heart healthy, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't, you know, I'm pretty, I'm pretty conservative. I don't want to put in a statin just to make your numbers look better if it's not going to make you live longer. Huh. It definitely won't make you feel better. It might, it might do the opposite, but it definitely won't make you feel better, mm -hmm. you know? So it kind of depends, you know, one thing, so one thing you could do is, you know, you know, everything else is okay. You know, you don't have diabetes, you don't have heart disease. You could do a calcium score, which is just a very quick scan of the heart to see if you to see if you have any plaque. If you do have 
a significant amount of coronary plaque in your heart blood vessels, um, which is a very quick screening test. And they actually, I think it's about 75 bucks or something like that out of pocket. Um, then it would then it would definitely be worth getting it being on a statin. Mm -hmm. so that will significantly lower your risk of having a stroke or heart attack in the near future, in the near term. Yeah. Well, if you have no plaque, then it's probably not a big deal. And you know, you can have the high, you can have a super high cholesterol and never get heart disease. Your cholesterol has to be in a form that gets easily taken up by the blood vessels in the heart to cause plaque. And that form means that it has to be oxidized. So, you know, different type, there's different subtypes of LDL. So for example, if your LDL is big and fluffy, it's, um, it's harder to oxidize it. If it's small and dense, it's much easier to oxidize. Also oxidation comes about through inflammation. Inflammation can be caused by lack of sleep, you know, high carb diet, um, the common cold, any, any kind of infection can cause inflammation. So just right. because you're high cholesterol, it doesn't mean you're gonna get heart disease. So there's other things we can look at. In the setting of someone who's otherwise very, very healthy with no other cardiac risk factors. I had uh, about, I guess it's been about 10 years. I had, I went through all the uh, uh, internal, the photograph and, and everything in the charts and. Yeah, and then, uh, the the color photograph that showed the you know, the plaque, you could see that it was is it was a little bit. That. It was a little bit, and that, I say about ten years ago. So that's okay. when I asked if I could, you know, to go on the. Uh, In that case, it's probably a good idea to see if it would keep it down. So, so I don't know if it's working, or I guess it's time to go back and and have that re-exam to see uh, what's happened over the last ten years. Was that a calcium score? So that was a calcium score, John? Yes. Yes. So in that case, if, if you did have, a, you know, if it was a little bit, a little bit elevated, then it is, a, it is a good idea to be on a statin. It will lower your risk, even in the short term of having a stroke or heart attack, as long as you tolerate it. You know, I don't, I obviously don't want you to be tortured by it, but there's not a lot of use in repeating that calcium score because it won't go down. And in fact, the statin may make the, paradoxically may make this calcium score look worse. Because one of the things that statins do is they take non-calcified plaque, which you don't see on a calcium score, and they make it calcified, which makes it less risky, less likely to rupture. But just because that score is going up on your calcium score, it doesn't change anything we would do. Our goal is to really just keep your cholesterol down. You know? mm. Would you recommend I change anything with my medication? Well, that's difficult to say without seeing you, John. <laughs> Put you on the and without, without, well, it's difficult to say. Well, no, it's difficult to say without seeing you, without knowing your numbers. Yeah. Um, I would try to get your statin to a dose where your LDL is less than seventy, if you have, a, 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 you know, a relatively elevated um, calcium score. But if you're the other, the other limiting factor is how much will you tolerate. So. If you're tolerating the statin well, it's not a bad idea to go up on it. You know, I would recommend heart healthy diet though. You know, I'd always recommend that. But at 85, I don't want to torture you too much too. You should be allowed to do a little bit of what you want. You know. Okay. Well, thank you very much for your. Interview. No, not at all, John. Thank you. Thank you, John. Uh, does anybody else have questions? I don't see any in the uh, Q&A chat feature. So you all have the option to unmute yourself if you have questions. I have a question for you, doctor. If, oh, is that Jennifer? Um, yeah, I'm not speaking for myself. I'll just say that. So I can't answer your question if you ask how high the calcium score is. Okay. But if, if somebody's calcium <clears throat> score comes back, they're put on statins. Mm -hmm. um, is, is any of that reversible? Even it, especially if they do change their diet, will any of the calcium buildup be reversible? So, you know, calcium is just, who, who am I speaking to by the way, sorry? This is Jennifer. Oh, Jennifer. Okay, I thought but so. I'm not talking about myself, so I can't tell you how bad it was, but it, okay, I guess good. you read between the lines that I might be talking about my husband. <laughs> okay. Well, you know, so the calcium, you know, when you see that calcium number on a calcium score, 
that's really just a surrogate marker for plaque. And statistically, it's a good, you know, there's good data to show that if your calcium score is above a certain level, you have this much percentage chance of having a blockage and this much percentage chance of having um, a stroke or heart attack in the next five years if you do nothing about it. Um, so if your calcium score is over, you know, is, is over 100, then um, actually if it's over 400, then you have a 50% risk of having a, a, a significant blockage and your risk of having a stroke or heart attack in the next five years is almost 20% if your calcium score is over 400. Now, and I'll get, I will answer your question. I promise I'm just kind of going over the background a little bit, but it's just a surrogate marker. So, you know, not all plaque is calcified. You also have non-calcified plaque. Um, and we know that, you know, which is why it's not, it's not as reliable to do a calcium score in someone who's less than 50, 40 or 50 years old because non-calcified plaque may predominate calcified plaque. Um, and so we don't know what that calcium is really telling us because there may be a lot more non-calcified plaque than calcified plaque because they're too young to have developed calcified plaque. Now over age 50, um, there's good, statistically speaking, the calcified plaque is a good surrogate marker of total plaque. And there's a lot of data behind that. The problem is, is you treat, as you treat the, um, with a statin, you do treat the, the calcium, you treat the calcium score of, um, that calcium score could, could actually go up. But being on the statin and driving your cholesterol low can actually shrink away plaque. So the total plaque burden will go down but the calcium score will go up. And what's been shown on ultrasounds, they've actually done this study where they did a little, they put the ultrasounds in people's blood vessels and put them on statins and they, they try to find what the LDL level is that uh, beyond which if you go below that, the plaque starts to shrink away, shrink away rather than just stabilize. And the magic number on average was 67, which is where the number 70 on LDL comes from um, in terms of that's the number we wanted to get lower than in, in patients with heart disease because the number in the studies where plaque started, plaque started shrinking away was 67. So the answer is yes, it can shrink away um, with statins, but that doesn't mean the calcium score goes down. The calcium score may actually go up even though it's shrinking away, if that makes sense. It's kind of complicated. Does that make sense, Jennifer? Yeah, it did make sense. I just keep telling him he needs to change his diet. And that right. he can't the just other, rely on the statin to fix yes. everything. But I think yeah, he was you know, disillusioned with the calcium score that he thought, oh, well, I'm just going to live life, you know, day yeah. by day. <laughs> yeah. Because I know it was a high number. Yeah. So, you know, if it is above 400, then that doesn't, that, that, that does mean that you have, that puts you in a statistical group where you're just having a stroke or heart attack over the next five years is almost 20%. However, if you do a stress test, and your stress test is completely normal, then your, that drives down your statistical risk of having a stroke or heart attack to less than 3% over the next five years. Wow, that's interesting. Bearing in mind that you, you, know, you do um, medically manage them. So that's important to note. So if it is over a certain level, it is worth doing a stress test because when it is over a certain level, there's a good chance that you are asymptomatic but still have um, a significant blockage. And it's one of the very few um, subsets of patients that I actually do stress tests in, even if they're asymptomatic. Hmm. Well, thank you. Interesting. And diet and exercise, you're absolutely right. You know, diet and exercise is important, Mediterranean diet. You know, and I also, so the, the diets I recommend, the Mediterranean diet, nuts, seeds, extra virgin olive oil, whole grains, cut down on desserts, obviously. And um, I do recommend some form of intermittent fasting. And the reason I do that is when you don't eat, um, you know, so most people in the US and the Western world these days uh, prosperous enough that they have three meals a day with multiple snacks. When you do do that, you have fuel, you're in a perpetually fed state, which means you have fuel readily available in your blood um, whenever needed. And when that happens, you're never using your fuel stores. So you're never giving your, you know, you're never giving your pancreas or your liver a break. And you know the beta cells are working and working in the pancreas all the time. The liver is always metabolizing, um, and you're never giving them a break. You know when you are fasting in a fasting state, you actually break down your fat cells, the triglycerides and fat cells, into fatty acids, um, and you use that for fuel um, because you don't have the fuel readily available. So you're using you're using your fat stores. You also produce ketones when you're fasting, which sets off a cascade 
of enzymatic reactions where you know you have a lot of antioxidants produced that that, that sort of thing um and you know intermittent fasting has shown to increase memory to um, lower heart disease and to um actually prevent um it does help prevent cancer as well actually and the reason for that is the cancer cells themselves um need glucose to survive but when you're fasting you're not using as much glucose you're mainly using fatty acids that are broken down from your fat stores so whereas your own cells are quite happy cancer cells are not as happy in those cases but if you were to do if you were to do intermittent fasting i'm you know uh, i'm a i'm not a proponent of jumping into it i'm a proponent of taking you know going into it very gradually because it can be dangerous if you jump into the regimens Jennifer, um, does anybody else have any other questions or is there anything um, that you, Dr. Cello, would like to share? I have a question. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, back uh, referring to the intermittent, intermittent fasting, how long can you stay on that and maintain to maintain it? <laughs> it's, I mean, I've heard that that wasn't help, helpful either. Well, I think what you, is this, is this Gwendolyn again? Yes, it's me. Okay. So I think what you do, you know, the 12 to 7 kind of thing is pretty reasonable. Um, you know, I, I think that's reasonable to maintain. I think it can be sustained, you know, because that gives you about, what, 17 hours? Yeah. Of um, and you've been doing that for a little while. Do you still have cravings from that? Cravings? No, I haven't had any problem. Uh, once I was on it after a couple of weeks, I I was surprised that yeah, I'm yeah. not hungry, you know. Um, yeah. And that's why I was surprised that I gained ten pounds. <laughs> you know, yeah. I'm like, I don't that's get weird. it. That is weird. So you know, typically that doesn't happen. Typically, you do lose weight like that. The cravings do go away after about thirty days. Yeah. You know, built to be perpetually fed. You know, our ancestors, hunter-gatherers, they, they didn't have like three meals a day. They didn't, you know, have with, with multiple snacks. You know, our, our closer ancestors weren't as prosperous as us, so they could afford to do that. You know, we're kind of, we live in a society now where that's common, you know. But um, I think it's very maintainable. You know, I've been doing it, so I have a good case study. I, I do the same as you, actually, 12 to 7. You know, so the, the intermittent fasting regimen is uh, every other day just fast completely every other day. There's the two days a week, the five, two. And then there's the 18, six, where you fast for 18 hours and you eat between 12 and six or 10 and four, something like that. Um, you know, I just recommend, I'm not very, you know, what I do is just recommend, um, I don't, I'm not very aggressive with it. What I, what I usually tell people is have the breakfast a little bit later, have their dinner a little bit earlier, don't snack at all after your dinner. Try to keep the snacks to a minimum. And if you do snack, either have, have a bowl of berries or have um, nuts and seeds. And that works quite well. And people maintain that quite well, actually. Um, if you're not gonna maintain it, you'll start maintaining it within the first couple of weeks. If you if you can do that for um, like a few weeks, then, you'll, then it's very easy to stay on it because the cravings go away. Yeah, well, I mean, I, I love breakfast. That was my favorite meal. So now I have it for okay. lunch, you know, it's just- yeah. That's what I did. I switched the brunch, and which is and it's doable. And uh, but I, I just, <coughs> I guess, frustrated because I'm not getting any of the results that I want. Um, right. So anyway, because, but I was just wondering because I've had other people say, "Oh no, you can't do that every day." And I said, "Well, I've been doing it for a couple months, you know." And right. You know, I don't feel any better or any worse, really. Uh, no. Change. Okay. Okay. I. Feel better after doing it, and most people, most people do tend do say they feel better. They have more energy, and and actually, a lot most people when they switch, um, when they go back to that and they stop doing it, they actually feel worse. They feel bloated. They feel more tired, fatigued. Well, maybe maybe I can relate and say I'm not as tired. It used to be where I would sit down at three or four o'clock to catch the news or something. I would crash, right. and I'm not I'm not doing that now. Um, yeah. So maybe there that that's different. But I want to see the weight go away. That's my main. Yeah. Thing. I want yeah, to see I mean, the I think numbers. If you combine it with combine it with exercise and that sort of thing. That that would be helpful too. And also, you know, you can't just do the intermittent fasting. You still have to eat healthy. 
you know. Yes, and and I I think I do, but um, okay. I guess it's just going to take longer. It took a long time to get here, so maybe a little longer to get it off. Right, right. right. Well, it sounds like you 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 have a lot of willpower, so that's impressive. No, I, no, I don't, but uh, I'm trying. I am trying. Thank you. No, not Are at you? all, Gwendolyn. Okay, right. y'all. And I, I see a question here from Claudia that says, what type and how much exercise for someone age 60 versus someone age 85? Um, it really depends on the patient. Um, okay. Yeah, it really depends on the patient. Um, you know, I have, I have some 60-year-old patients that seem like they're 85, and I have some 85-year-old patients that seem like they're 60. So it kind of depends. But, you know, typically what we say is mod, for everyone across the board, moderate aerobic activity for 30 minutes, five to six days a week, which is, which is the exercise regimen that's been studied that lowers cardiovascular risk. Now, when we say moderate aerobic activity or moderate exercise, obviously that moderate activity is different for a 60-year-old versus an 85 year old. So, and really you can, you can quantify that by heart rate. So if you, you know, moderate aerobic activity is considered 70 to 70 to 75% of the maximum age predicted heart rate. So the maximum age predicted heart rate is 220 minus age. So obviously the exercise capacity changes with age. So let's see here. So if I get my calculator on my iPhone, give me a sec. So for a 60 year old, um, you would really wanna get your heart rate between 110 to 120 um, for about 30 minutes a day. And that would be a good exercise program for an 85 year old. it would be around 100 to 110. So it is a slower heart rate, 100 to 105 actually, um, which obviously is less activity. So that would be the way to quantify that. But really you, you have to listen to your body. I mean, moderate aerobic activity and to, it really is how much, how much can you do without really overdoing it, straining your body, you know? And that would come on more over time. It looks like all the questions are answered. Um, so thank you, Dr. Chawla. Um, and thank you everyone for attending. Um, we appreciate you being here. Uh, we won't be having our um, bi-weekly webinar due to the holidays, um, but we will start again in January of 2021. So thank you again for everyone joining us today and we hope you and your family have a wonderful holiday. Yep, thank you, happy holidays. Thank you. Okay. Bye-bye.